All right, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 for our Sunday school lesson. Hebrews chapter 11. With, we read through verse 31 last time, but let's go back over this and uh, observe a few details. I mentioned that the ABC of faith seems to be an action based on a belief and sustained by confidence. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's the conviction that you can trust what you're trusting. It's also, it also begins with an assumption that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The word diligent is worth noting. If you're a Roman Catholic whose life is still empty, you can't say, well, I tried Christianity and that didn't help, so maybe I'll try something else now. You haven't tried Christianity at all. You know something, Roman Catholicism is nothing but a stage play in three acts. Go to a Catholic church, go to a mass. I've been working in the funeral business for uh, 33 years. And I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Catholic funeral masses I've gone to, but I've gone to other Catholic services, um, and the format is basically the same. It starts in the back of the church, the priest comes back, he's got his robe on, maybe a couple of altar servers. He greets the people out of, the, out of his missal, his prayer book. And then they proceed up the aisle, either with candles. Um, if you're lucky at a funeral, you get to smell the incense, right? And uh, there's a musician playing. There's a procession going up the center aisle as a big formal entry. And they get to the front of the altar, uh, the priest and the altar uh, assistants, they bow in unison toward the cross, like the Beatles used to do toward the audience in the 60s. And they take their places, then they go into the liturgy of the Word, that's Act 1. The liturgy of the Eucharist, that's Act 2. Then some final commendations, that's Act 3. Sometimes they will allow people to come up and sing a song, make a few personal comments or some announcements. That's at the priest's discretion. But it's the same play acted out every single day of the year, 365 days a year, actually 364 days of the year, Good Friday is the one day of the year Catholics don't uh, do Mass. The so-called day that commemorate the death of Jesus Christ is the one day they don't do it. Go figure. I don't know why. But it, it, it's the same conclusion, you're, it's the same um, climax at the end of the play every time. And the priest... Even in the Missal, the instruction books show the priest when to make the sign of the cross, when to hold his hands over his chest, when to do a number of things, like a script. The, the directions are written on the Missal. But the people don't know that. They think this man's extra pious because of the way he holds his hands differently than we hold our hands. When you don't know God, you fake it by costume and by bodily gestures. That's all it comes down to. People think, well, I tried Christianity, and I guess uh, that didn't work, so maybe I'll try something else. Catholicism creates more atheists than it solves. And how many atheists will say, I used to be Catholic when I was growing up? I used to be Catholic. I used to be an Anglican, which is just a Catholic who flunked his Latin, right? But uh, Catholicism creates more atheism than it solves, than it cures. And so, if you're not diligent to find the truth of the Word of God, don't say you tried it and it didn't work and you're going to try something else. You haven't tried it yet. He that hath the Son hath life. Not somebody who has a religion. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Uh, verse 7, again in Hebrews 11 here. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became the heir, excuse me, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. 
Uh, here's a case where the faith is placed in the future. But Noah uh, had to have faith in God in the present daily life in order to find grace. Genesis 6 verse 8 says God, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Before God told him anything about things not seen as yet, he had to have a walk with God day by day. It also says Noah moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. This gives fear as a genuine and a proper motive for serving God. A good healthy fear will keep you alive on the freeway. Foolishness will get you in a wreck. But a good healthy fear about not going too fast, not getting out of your lane, watching what the people on either side are doing, that'll keep you alive, that'll keep you healthy on the road. There's, this fear is also uh, trembling. Go back uh, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Notice there Philippians 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1, notice there, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. A good fear of the Lord will keep you wise. Someone who doesn't fear God is a fool. Someone who doesn't fear uh, what God can do to him if he decides to chastise him, if he decides to punish him, if he decides to deal with him after his actions, his sins, that man's a fool. Or that woman, anyone who says, I don't need God, I'm not interested in God, God can't do anything, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You haven't got any good sense at all. An example, go back to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel 33. <clears throat> Ezekiel 33, notice there, verses 7 and 8. Ezekiel 33, verses 7 and 8. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. You should fear failing the Lord. That'll, that's a good motive for you living for God. That's a good motivation for you to serve Jesus Christ. Do what you can to reach somebody else before they end up dead somewhere and face God in eternity uh, unprepared. One thing you don't want to do whenever possible is, is enter into something unprepared. Um, if you buy an insurance policy, car insurance, homeowner's insurance, life insurance, you have certain promises spelled out in the policy, in writing. And because it's based on, because it's in writing, you hold that company accountable to fulfill what they've sold you. And the way we have confidence that we're saved is because we read it on the pages of the Bible. We believe what we're, what's written to us in black and white. So it was just an open promise given orally, just a handshake, and there's nothing ironclad in actual writing you could pinpoint and say, this is what I'm holding you to. Well, then someone could renege and say, well, we never promised that because it's not in writing. You watch these Judge Judy programs and TV shows, you know, if you don't have an agreement with the other party in writing, then don't come and say, well, he promised me he'd do this, she said she'd do that. 
the judge is not interested in that. They're interested in what's actually written down. They can only hold you accountable and uh, hold uh, responsible the things that are written down or put in writing, I should say. And so it is with salvation and depending on the Word of God to be telling you the truth. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Over there, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. You should have the judgment seat of Christ in mind and the fear of not having receiving any reward for service to Jesus Christ one day when you reach that. From the moment you're saved until the moment you stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat, that time in between your Christian life, your Christian uh, career, if you want to call it that, uh, is the thing, is the time span of time frame for which you're going to be judged when you stand before Jesus Christ. What did you do as a Christian for me? Did you do anything to bring honor to God? Did you do anything to bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you do anything to show your, your gratitude, your uh, appreciation, your thankfulness for all God did for you in saving your soul? I don't understand someone who never is motivated to help someone else uh, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, after God's done so much for them. It's hard to understand someone who could just take and take and take and not want to give back, not want to reach somebody else and say, listen, I believed I was lost. When I turned my life to Jesus Christ, I felt a sense of relief and satisfaction and forgiveness that I had never known before. A sense of peace came over me. I could... I believe I could trust the scriptures and they've given me comfort when I read them. And God wants to do the same thing for you. Why you wouldn't want to tell somebody about that? Not only does God uh, give comfort, but he forgives sins. Why you wouldn't want to tell that, convey that to somebody else that needs to hear it is a great mystery. And then verse 14 back here in Hebrews 11, I mean... Here's my own Bible back over there. There verse 14 says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 16, But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. The they isn't Abraham and Sarah, but it's a reference to someone else like Abraham, or like Sarah, they that say such things is not a reference to Abraham looking for a city in the land of promise, as verse 9 mentioned when we were there. They is a reference to someone like Sarah, like Abraham. But who? Well, go forward a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any abasement. Peter was writing to born-again men and women in the church age. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes... Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's men and women. 1 Peter 5 and verse 13, Paul or Peter writes, The church that is at Babylon, elect together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Well, that would have been the land of Babylon still existing, and the believers all the way over there. The Catholic Church says, well, Babylon, that's a, that's a code word for Rome the city of Rome. 
they damn themselves by saying that. When they say that that's a code word for uh, Rome, meaning Peter is sort of a secretly, cryptically referring to Christians in the city of Rome, but he uses their name Babylon. You know what, that's a, they damn themselves because you go to Revelation 17, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. That's clearly wrong. But um, they're not looking for a city in the land of promises. Abraham was. They're looking for a heavenly country. Verse 16. Uh, verse 16 again. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. Verses 2 and 3. Nigel saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them. And be their God. <clears throat> Let's finish this chapter. Pick up there at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, parentheses, the, of whom the world was not worthy. And in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report, through faith, received not the promises, excuse me, the promise. God had provided some better thing for us that they, without us, should not be made perfect. The writer can't go into any more detail. He's given sufficient examples up to this point. The point he's getting across is that faith has substance and evidence to it, as he mentioned all the way back in verse 1. Let's review some of the examples uh, that we just covered. Mm, verse 33 said, uh, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained the promises. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, God's, God tells uh, David that he's going to bless his seed generations to come. Bless his household for generations to come. And verse 34, quench the violence of fire. Well, that'd be the three Hebrew children. That's a good example. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, in the fiery furnace. Uh, did we not cast in three? Lo, I see uh, four men walking about, and the fourth is like the Son of God. Um, escape the edge of the sword. <coughs> There's uh, David fleeing from Saul, and Saul pursuing him. A great example of that, back in 1 Samuel 20. It says later, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Judges 15, verse 15. Samson slays a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Part of that skeleton. Women receive their dead, raised to life again. 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah goes to the widow's house, her, her son is dead, and he laces himself across the body of that child and 
praise the God to revive that child's soul. The soul comes back into that child, comes back to life again. Verse 35, women receive their dead. Well, I have read that. Raise to life again. Uh, oh, verse 36, more about bonds and imprisonments. Joseph was put in prison for years under Potiphar's rule before God elevated him and made him the second a highest ruler in all of the kingdom of Egypt, Genesis 39. Uh, verse 37, they were stoned. 1 Kings chapter 21, uh, uh, Ahab is upset by a prophecy Naboth gives him. And uh, Naboth, so he, he finds a way to accuse Naboth of having blasphemed God as a justification to stone him to death. And he, he stones him to death and then steals his vineyard, his property, away from him. <clears throat> it says they uh, wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins. Well, that would have been Elijah, 2 Kings, chapter 1. Also would have been John the Baptist, Matthew, chapter 3. Goatskins, sheepskins. Verse 38 says, of whom the world was not worthy. You ever read, you ought to, every Christian should read a good account, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Or there's another big, big, thick book called The Martyr's Mirror. Big, thick volume, like an encyclopedia, The Martyr's Mirror. And uh, they've got wood engravings uh, reproduced showing the the persecution of Catholicism against Protestants for centuries during the Dark Ages and the uh, the Inquisition period. We used to have a back in 15 oh what year was it 15 I don't want to get the wrong date I was going to say 1570 but it might be a different year. The Roman Catholic Church executed what they called the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. In, in France, they gave a signal at midnight that all the Protestant homes would be invaded and uh, on, this, on the Feast of St. Bartholomew. And so they, in about 72 hours, murdered 50,000 Protestants in France, Huguenots. And the Pope struck a commemorative coin uh, commemorating that event. We used to have a picture of that coin on our website. We need to revive that and put that prominent on our website once again so people don't forget. 50,000 Protestants in about 72 hours, maybe 96 hours, something like that. And uh, this is the history of Catholicism. Burn them at the stake, stretch them on a, on a torture device, lop off their arms and legs. They Some of the torturous uh, means uh, men have devised to persecute and torment and torture and murder people for simply not submitting to the authority of the Pope. Right now, the Catholic Church is being led by a big pansy, pervert, faggot, atheist called the Pope. That's all he is right now. He's friendly with the fags, he's friendly with the atheists, he's friendly with everybody except God. Uh, popes are nothing but politicians. They are not men of God. They never have been. They are false. They're frauds. They're pretenders. The one thing you can say is that in times past, decades past, and even centuries past, the world was a different world. People had a little bit more character. They would give lip service to God, even if they weren't born again. They would give lip service to God and reverence to the scriptures, even if they never read them, didn't study them, didn't know them, never memorized them. You can say that about a lot of, uh, you can still say that about some um, conservative thinking Roman Catholic citizens in the United States today. Mm -hmm. They may be lost on their way to hell, but they have some respect, some measure of respect for God and the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, such as they know it. 
and they want their children to have some respect for the things of God, those things that they believe are, are part of worshiping God and worshiping Jesus Christ and knowing the life of the Holy Spirit. But uh, finding people like that is very difficult anymore. And um, New Testament was actually. Before I finish, go to um, go back to Exodus thirty-four. Exodus thirty-four. <laughs> Here's something else interesting. Exodus 34. Notice there verses 6 and 7. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and to the fourth generation. Go forward again to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Hebrews 9, and verse 22 there says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Like a cancer patient whose case happens to be in remission, it's lying dormant, it's somehow rendered inactive at the moment. But Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. That's why God says, well, by no means clear the guilty. He'll forgive it, but it's not cleared from your record. Go back, if you will, to John chapter 1. Gospel of John chapter 1. John chapter 1, notice there verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the difference between the animals in the Old Testament and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for us in the New. The New Testament was, in, was instituted to clear the sinner whose sins had been in remission, but they weren't taken away. Um, they needed a perfect sacrifice once and for all to accomplish all of that. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me illustrate it the way I've done it before. God gave man dominion over the animals, Genesis chapter 1. And then he said, I want you to offer, an animal, uh, offer animals and beasts as sacrifices for your sins, when you sin. But the animal was not equal to the man in value. The man was given dominion over the animals, and that's what God commanded to be offered. What man needed was a sacrifice that was not only equal to him in value, but even greater than him in value. So that once that death was uh, carried out, it wouldn't have to be repeated. This is, so, this is how far above modern and mortal man the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is and always will be. His death was sufficient once and for all. If the death of Jesus Christ wasn't perfectly sufficient one time, one time only, it'll never be perfectly sufficient no matter how many times the Catholic priest wants to repeat it. It'll always be weak. The Holy Spirit doesn't dwell on the sins of some of these men. Jephthah, David, his... Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, he doesn't dwell on some of these sins. Um, uh, Barak was afraid to serve God. <clears throat> He's those, those saints, uh, but on the grace of Jesus Christ, now able to cover them. 
since the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a marvelous thing about the, the Word of God. When God sees you, He no longer sees you as a believer, covered and guilty of the sins that you once committed. He now sees you covered with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's not a single, name for me one sin that a person could commit that the grace of God uh, by Jesus Christ isn't sufficient, isn't able to cover. One sin that you could commit that the forgiving, forgiveness and grace of Jesus Christ wasn't able to cover. Return to God in faith and ask God for forgiveness. I can't think of one. And then verse 40 of this text, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And then verse 39, but let me back up there, these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. There's a thing called deferred gratification. How many have heard that phrase before? Deferred gratification. In the world, uh, in real life, it used to be, if you can't afford something, you don't get to have it yet. When my wife and I got married, we got uh, offers for easy, sign this film form out and get a credit card. That was a bad decision. <laughs> they wanted to get you hooked uh, and indebted to someone else by credit as soon as possible and make it easy as possible for you to get it. And then you're their slave for the rest of your life. <clears throat> but if you don't, if you can't afford it, then generally you're not supposed to have it yet. You're not entitled to have it yet. What I hate is going to the 99 cent store. There's some guy in there wanting to sell everybody up for Obama phones. Um, I was walking through there one day, and the guy says, "Hey, you need a cell phone?" I said, "No, apparently I'm paying full price for mine. Can't for theirs too." They've got the same offers now. Uh, you need high-speed internet. We got a discount for you in the same format as the Obama phone, you know, the cheap thing. Somebody else is paying more than full price to cover your cheap price. And then the government says, well, see, everybody's getting it. Isn't that fair for everybody? No, it's not fair for the guy who's paying more. Drive down the street on my way to work. I see homeless people with shopping carts. They've got smartphones. Someone's paying for it. It's not them. I know they're not paying for it because whenever I walk or run into them on the street, they've always, they always want a handout. So evidently, they've got no steady income to pay for their phones and pay for whatever else they have. And uh, deferred gratification. If you can't afford it, you don't get to have it right now. But the world doesn't want to live that way. Um, go back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter, I'm sorry, not 1 Samuel, Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah 40. And notice there verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Someone says, well, that word wait, that wait, that word wait can go two direct, have two meanings. Does it mean to wait patiently and not do anything until you're, you're sure what to do yet? Or does it mean to wait on God like a waiter, looking to serve him, looking to do something for him? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> First Peter chapter five. First Peter five and verses five and six. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Wait for it. Some things are worth waiting for. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 
Galatians 6, and uh, begin there at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. All of those saints in the Old Testament who had promises given to them and hopes of a future land of promise on the earth as descendants of Abraham died not having received it yet. You know why the, the identity of Jewish people is not erased from the world yet? Because God still intends to fulfill promises he gave to Abraham 4,000 years ago. It's a miracle, really. It's a modern miracle. It's, it defies most people's explanation that there is an identity of people who say the world hates us, People accuse us of everything. They blame us for their own financial problems. And we've got our own problems to answer for. But we are Jews. Verse 17, for, um, verse, 17 verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Eventually, the physical, fleshly Jewish nation will inherit the land of promise here on the earth as God once promised to Abraham. And the glorified believers, saints, Christians, you and I, will be given New Jerusalem as our eternal home. You know one of the stupidest things that you'd ever hear is the Mormon idea that the city of New Jerusalem is going to come down and it's going to land in the city of Independence, Missouri. Independence, Missouri is, is the city where they say New Jerusalem will be established. Read the dimensions of New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. First of all, it's about 1,200 miles on one side, square, and 1,200 miles on one side. That's much bigger than it'll fit in the Independence, Missouri. And the Bible nowhere says that it touches the earth. It descends. It never says it touches the earth. It may be an orbiting satellite for all we know. Or something along those lines. That's not far-fetched. Modern man understands the idea of uh, satellite, space stations, things of that kind. But it'll be, it'll be the eternal home of the saints. And the world will be given to the Jew. A physical inheritance, a physical uh, promise granted Centuries and centuries ago, God's going to fulfill those things, but it's all going to come to fulfillment only in the complete uh, work of the Lord Jesus Christ and those trusting in Him at that time. I rushed through a lot of this, and I hope it wasn't too uh, confusing. God willing, we'll be able to go to chapter 12 next time. So let's, uh, let's bring this to a conclusion. By the way, here's something aside, a little side note. As I read through my Bible, as you read through your Bible, you come across words um, and you see the the Bible will give you the, the Hebrew word, and it'll tell you what the, the word means. Such as the word Mara, M-A-R-A-H, as it's spelled, Exodus 15, means bitter or bitterness. So I began compiling a list of Hebrew words when they come across those words, the English definitions that come with them, and the references just to see how much Hebrew language I could learn from reading the English Bible. The Bible's 
full of all kinds of ways to study, all kinds of ways to learn. All right, let's bow for prayer, and we'll, we'll bring this lesson to a conclusion. Heavenly Father, we love you. We ask that you would dismiss us from this lesson. We, uh, again, thank you for the music we heard over in the other building. Thank you for dads and our fathers. We ask that we'd render proper honor and loving tribute to them today. We thank you for our Heavenly Father and the one who sent a, the Lord Jesus Christ to suffer for our sake. We love you, Lord. We, we can't say that more powerfully than we can now or often enough. We thank you for what we have by the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that our names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you that a part of us is already seated in heaven uh, with Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost. We ask that you strengthen our faith and draw us close to thee and closer in fellowship with one another. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>